So, my name is Andreas. I work with Samsung, and um, I mainly work on interfacing the block layer from Rust. Um, and so today we're going to talk about how to interface the C interfaces from Rust in a safe way. And uh, can I just quickly ask, raise of hand, how many people in here are comfortable writing Rust code? Quite a few. Cool. Um, yeah, let's see. So I have a lot of slides, and I'm probably not going to go through all of them. So if you have any questions, just ask them, and then we'll take them in line. So this year's uh, September conference run has been very different than the last year for me. The general, um, you know, the general mood around Rust has changed, and people are asking questions like, instead of a, in, instead of but instead of talking about um, like I don't instead of people saying I don't want Rust in my subsystem, people are asking like, what should I do when the Rust people come from my subsystem, right? How how can I like make this process less uh, better. And so we've been talking a lot about Rust with all of the kernel people. And a question I get a lot is like, why is it so complicated? People see these um, things that they do and see in four or five lines, and then uh, they see the abstractions that enable users to use the C APIs from Rust, and they're like 75 lines to do the same thing. And why is it so much, like why is it 75 lines of weird pointy brackets to do a simple thing. Why, where does this come from? And that's what I'm going to try to uh, explain today, why this, uh, where, the, where this is coming from and why, uh, why we need to have this complexity, unfortunately. First, so first we're going to talk a little bit about memory safety. I'm going to rush a bit through that so we can get to the later part. Then. Uh, you, those of you that are not block layer experts, we're just going to take a quick overview of the interfaces we're working with, and then we're going to get to the the core later. Why should we care about memory safety? I, I'm not going to go into too much details, but there's a bunch of people that has some empirical data that shows memory safety is really important, and it costs us a lot of time and money to not care about not not that we don't care about it, but um, when we use memory unsafe languages, we get a lot of memory, uh, memory safety uh, bugs and they cost time and money. So um, we also more like the second to, let's see if I can point. We also have data that shows people are more productive in Rust than in, uh, in for instance, C++. Maybe that's because they don't have to spend so much time hunting their memory safety box. We don't know. Yeah, so memories, uh, box coming from memory safety, they take time and therefore they cost money to fix. Sometimes we don't f uh, find them. And then we have uh, uh, maybe like some kind of CVE in the wild. They lead to functional problems and we actually have data that show if we use memory safe languages, we don't get these errors. So simply by changing our implementation language, we can, we can uh, avoid this large class of, uh, of bugs. So specifically for the, what memory safety is in Rust, Rust, in, uh, Rust has a, the full Rust language is not memory safe, but we have a subset of the language that is safe. And there's some, um, um, the kind of safety we get is uh, absence of uh, type confusions, absence of race conditions, and absence of uh, use after free, buffer overflows, uh, all those kind of errors. And this is not just something we think. There's actually some researchers that have done a formal proof of this. There's a paper called Rust Build that you can find if you Google for it that shows uh, like a formal verification or not a verification. I don't know what it is. They proved it with math, so they believe in it. So, quickly, a block layer refresher. Um, in Linux, we have, uh, when applications do uh, block I.O., they send it into the kernel via one of many interfaces. And these I.O. requests, they go into the block layer, where we have um, 
a uh, per core software queue where we can do all kinds of stuff on these requests, merge them, reorder them, or uh, do fairness scheduling. And after the block layer is done with these requests, it sends them off to the driver, which I put down here. Um, the driver has a number, is managing a number of hardware queues that may be less than the number of per core software queues that we have. And the interface we're going to talk about today is this one down here. The things that our driver receives from the kernel when the kernel wants to send IO to a device is a struct request pointer. I uh, made it, uh, I simplified it a lot here to just have the things we, we need to talk about today. The struct request is basically a, uh, a gather list of uh, memory that you want to sequentially write to the device at a certain, uh, at a certain address on the device and it has a tag to identify the request. It also has um, at the end some amount of uh, space for the driver to put its own stuff. So in C this is just like a void pointer and then you have a variable sized struct. The kernel will, uh, when you set up your driver, you will tell um, the kernel how many requests you can, your hardware supports to have in flight, and the kernel will allocate a buffer of these request structures and uh, initialize them, all of them, um, once. And then it will call into your driver and ask your driver to initialize the, the private area uh, for, for each of these requests. And then the, uh, these requests are, um, are cached and reused, so you don't allocate and deallocate all the time. Um, when you implement a uh, block device driver in C, you have to basically uh, build a uh, virtual function table and, oh, I'm losing my microphone here. You have to build a um, a struct and fill it up with function pointers and you give that to the kernel and the kernel uses that to call into your driver to, to uh, give it work to do. Uh, for, for block devices, it's, it's the block MQ ops struct and uh, I put here a few, um, I simplified it a bit, I put a few that I want to talk about, a few of the functions. But, so you have one function that the kernel calls to queue work with your uh, driver. Uh, you have one that the kernel will call when uh, a, a request is finished and you have one it will call it for, for the driver to initialize the private uh, the private data part of your request and also to destroy it after and um, an example of how to fill this is from the C null block driver uh, the C null block driver fills it out like this and uh, it doesn't fill out all of the fields for instance it doesn't fill out the init request or exit request so uh, some of the fields are allowed to be null, some of them are not allowed to be null, and apparently the uh, null block driver does not need to initialize the private area of this. Uh, it does use it, it, it has stuff in there, but it doesn't initialize it. So probably it's just initializing, like on every request, it, it sets up this private area, and then it's all fine. So let's look at uh, how to do this uh, from Rust. In Rust, we have this uh, thing called traits. A trait is like, a, if anyone did Java, it's like an interface. So anything that, uh, if you have any type that implements a trait, you know it will have a certain set of functions so that you can call into. And we would like to have a trait that um, that are all these uh, that expresses all these functions that go into this block MQ operations. Uh, so by the, having the user implement this trait for a type, we can use it as a block device. For, we could initialize the private er, the private data of this um, request just like C, pass in a pointer to the uh, the thing that we want to initialize, and then uh, just write through that pointer. But in Rust, um, writing through raw pointers is unsafe. The compiler cannot. What that means is the compiler cannot reason about what what uh, what happens when you write through a raw pointer. Uh, in Rust, instead, we have references, which are sort of life, sort of like pointers, but they're guaranteed to be non-null, and they have a lifetime attached to them. So the compiler will know uh, the duration of which they are valid. 
but we can't just turn a we, we can't just pass a reference here because um, we can't we're not allowed to have references to uninitialized data in Rust. That's instant undefined behavior. So when you have a reference in Rust, you know always that the data pointed to by this is uh, initialized. We have another complication uh, that is uh, like, uh, let's say we have a reference to this data. Uh, in Rust, uh, all values are movable by default, but we shouldn't be able to move uh, out of this a private data area because it lives in the cache of uh, of requests that the kernel has given us so it should stay there like we shouldn't move it elsewhere and have it still be cool and we, we teach the compiler that with a, it's a specific trait called pin I won't go into the details it just means data that's behind this pin uh, struct or type can't move you can't move it No questions? Everyone is uh, happy, ac happily accepting these? Cool. So, and th this is where some of the first complexity comes from. Because we have to tell the compiler that, um, we, ha we, have to tell the compi we have to tell the compiler that when it initializes a private data area of a struct request, it needs to do so uh, in a way that it knows the memory is uninitialized when it starts and when it finishes the uh, thing that comes out of it must not ever be moved. Uh, we have an abstraction for that that's called pin in it uh, that helps us do in place initialization. And that adds complexity. The pin in it stuff is like 1k line of code and 700 lines of documentation. Um, that is, it's not particularly easy to understand if you open that up and look into it, but it's kind of easy to use. The way we use it is uh, we, we, ch we change our function here in our trait to just return a pin in it type of the, t the place we want to initialize. And that basically means this function will now return um, a function that does the job for us. And we have, uh, in, in the kernel, we have macros that will help us create these functions. I put some links here to the uh, to the code for that if you're interested. Uh, yeah, and one thing that's important to note: uh, this construct doesn't cost anything at runtime. The complexity is at compile time. The way you would use it is, let's say I have my uh, I have my request, and at the end of this struct request, I'll have a uh, protocol-specific uh, data structure. In this case, it's uh, it has a timer. And I initialize the timer like so. You don't have to have these long paths with all the colons. But someone was talking about namespacing. That is what this is. We can import these things into our scope like uh, you would do in Python. And then it becomes more simple to read. Um, by the way, the, the timer, the, the patches for enabling access to this timer stuff is on the list and will hopefully go in soonish. Yeah, so we create a timer like this, and the compiler uh, will now check for us that when we're done, we actually initialized all of the fields of our uh, struct PDU, and nothing is left uninitialized. What about the rest of the, the functions? Here we have... Um, wh so what we, we would like our user that, that is implementing this uh, block device driver to to implement uh, this trait. And the methods on the trait should be the same or at least correspond to the one, to the ones that are on the uh, struct block MQ ops. So we'll have a queue and a, a queue request and a complete and a pull, etc. And we would like our, uh, we would like to, to have our user implement them, the functions on their type, like so. Uh, and you can see this is from the uh, null block, uh, device that is, uh, it's actually in the kernel now, it's in 6.11. Uh, big thanks to Jens for helping with getting that going. So, and I believe Fedora is going to enable it in Fedora 41. So if you have Fedora 41, you can load that module and play around with it. I don't know when that is going to be out, probably not yet. But what, what the point is, we need uh, to produce this struct 
block MQ ops um, vtable in a memory safe way. We can't just have our Rust user construct this table and fill it in with uh, func function pointers, because um, if you implement these uh, functions that we point to in this table in a wrong way, uh, we're going to have um, all kinds of problems. And, and the kernel will pass these raw pointers that we don't want to interface with in our uh, driver code. That would be unsafe. We wrap that in a layer that we, um, we can verify is safe and sound, and then the driver implementer uh, is shielded from all of this memory unsafety. Remember, if the driver is written in safe Rust, it's probably memory safe. It will never have null pointer exceptions or anything like that. And so this is where uh, complexity comes in, because we because we want the drivers to be impl implemented completely in safe Rust. We have to tell the compiler how to ensure that. Uh, the things it hands off to the dri driver developer can never um, cause uh, unsoundness or memory unsafety. And what, so what we do here is we have a, um, we create a struct operations V table that will help us generate this uh, block MQ operations. We make it generic over a type that implements operations. Operations is the one we have here that the user will implement. It has some fields, but it's it's not too important for the sake of this argument. We implement this. Um, we we implement functions on this struct. This is like a. This is like a. Uh, sort of like class methods. The the methods inside an input block will by default take a reference to the thing they operate on. But in this case, they are associated functions, and they are unsafe. We so you have to um, you have to when you call them, you have to state that the preconditions for calling them are correct. Uh, and it has X to C linkage, meaning that we can the we can um, the API to call them is what we have in C. So the kernel C side can call these functions. And the, if you look at these, the arguments here, they have um, the namespaces like bindings, uh, block MQ, something, something. These are the types from the C kernel that's, um, that's been through a preprocessor and put out so that Rust can understand them. So these are the, uh, the types that um, the block layer operates with. And inside, we do. Um, a bunch of unsafe operations on the pointers and uh, some checks to verify that the, uh, they, the, um, they are what they should be. And then we call into the user provided method. Because remember, we said this T must, Im must uh, implement this uh, trade operations. So we know that it has the QRQ function on it. And we can just call it like this. And so. Now I only I put one of the functions, but we do this for all of the functions that we want the kernel to be able to call. And we, uh, but we still have to generate this V table that we have to hand off to the kernel. And we do this by uh, creating an, a constant that has the correct type, and then we just fill it out here. And see, we put here um, this is a this is a way we can put uh, function pointers. Some is like a, it's an enumeration that can be none. And it it will be a null pointer in this case, or it can be sum, and then it will have a function pointer that goes somewhere. And we just link in all our all of our functions here. Also, init request and exit request, and I put also pull because pull is an optional method on the block MQ ops v table. You are in C, you are allowed to not put a function pointer, put a null pointer, and then the kernel will not call it. We have some magic to solve that, which is Another layer of complexity that I'm not going to go into. Um, sorry. That will uh, only put the function pointer if the user defines it on this uh, trade implementation that they're doing. Make sense? There's a question down here.
thank you. So I think this um, makes driver implementers write empty pull callbacks. No, they, we have. That's what, that's what I try to say. That we have some more magic that we can put on a trade. We have a macro called vtable, and that basically defines this uh, constant has pull only if the user implements this in their trade implementation. If oh. they don't implement it, it will be false, and you will have a null pointer put in here. OK, so there will, there will be an empty function, but it will only be called if the macro has done this generation. There will, yes, the exactly. macro The macro will generate an empty function that will not be. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But actually, what we have is in the uh, trade definition, you can have default implementations. Okay. And in there, we have an implementation there with an assert, like uh, a static compile time assert. You shouldn't be able to reach this. Okay, thank you. That's all cool. Now we can uh, now we can have our we can build our V table, uh, but we also have to give it to the kernel uh, somewhere, and we do that in the uh, tag set uh, when when you um, create when you instantiate a block device, you have to put a pointer to the V table in the tag set struct, and uh, we do this by somewhere in the code calling operations v table build, which just returns a static reference to the constant that we saw before. And then everything works. Uh, but again, like for the user, it, this all of this complexity is hidden for the driver implementer. It exists only in the kernel library uh, code. So um, yes, it's complex, but like we shield the user from it. We have uh, we have two other um, how to say um, challenges uh, in the in this uh, block layer uh, API. One of them is uh, block end request. So the the request is like a, a state machine when the when the kernel gives it to the driver, uh, the driver owns it and the driver has to signal to the kernel that it's done using it and it's now done. The block layer can now do something with it. The thing is, uh, to do that, you call this block MQ end request on the, on the request structure. The problem is you, you can't call this twice. If you call it twice, you have use after free. Um, and in C, it, I mean, that's fine. You do, of course, don't call it twice. That would be... Depending on who you ask, they will give you a more or less a pedagogical uh, explanation. But it's stupid. Don't call it twice. And that makes sense. But in Rust, in order to enforce memory safety, in, uh, in order for this proof, the Rust build proof to work, we have to uh, make sure that there are no soundness holes in our uh, APIs. And so it must be impossible to call this method twice. Uh, otherwise, the proof doesn't hold. So how do we do that? Oh, yeah, and that's, so that's one thing. Another thing is uh, uh, we, have a, we have a function called tag to request. Uh, you remember I have the, each request has a tag. It's basically an integer. And when, usually when you send off a request to hardware, you embed this ID into the, uh, uh, the, the message that you sent to the hardware. Then when the hardware completes the request, uh, the completion uh, entry will have this ID somewhere. And you can use that to figure out what struct request belongs to this completion from the hardware. Uh, and for that, to that purpose, there's a uh, translation mechanism in the block layer. This function, uh, tag to request. And again, in C, we, you, I mean, you only pass the ID that you get from hardware into this function. You don't pass like a random, you don't invest, invent an integer and pass into it. That would be, don't do that, right? But in Rust, we have to make it impossible to invent an integer and put into this function. Because if you are allowed to just invent an integer and put it in and get a random, uh, or get the request back from that integer, uh, you would be able to get a reference to a struct that's not owned by you. It's owned by the kernel and the kernel will or the block layer, and the block layer will write through it. And in Rust, when we have a uh, shared reference, the compiler will put um, 
the, the compiler will put special annotations in the LLVM code that tells, uh, the, the, that tells the LLVM this will not change. So we will have instant undefined behavior if you do that. And of course, we cannot allow this in uh, the Rust API because then again, our, our math proof doesn't hold. Uh, it must be safe. So how do we solve this? Uh, 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 let's see. Yeah, we, re we reference count our requests, of course. Um, we can do it like, okay, the, re the reference count is zero, the block layer owns this request, don't touch it. If it's one, it's owned by the driver, uh, but we don't have any like uh, references to it and no structures referencing it. If it's one, we have exactly one reference. If it's more, like there's more than one reference. Um, that was my idea. What could, oh, let's see, I think I double clicked. So yeah, so my first idea is like, the, the, let's reuse this uh, request.ref. The C struct request has an atomic ref uh, that um, uh, on first sight seems to be uh, set to one when the when the block layer hands off the request to the uh, to the to the driver, and uh, it's decremented to zero when the when the driver hands the request back. So let's use that. What could go wrong? Well, it turns out that uh, IOSTAT is also using this request to make sure that the request doesn't disappear when you uh, uh, when it does stats on the request. Um, that took me a long time to figure out why that was, but uh, eventually found that was it. And of course, then stuff breaks. The, then this um, scheme I put before uh, doesn't work. How do you guarantee existence of the request uh, object in order to be able to use ref? So if you just get a pointer to the request, how do you make sure it does not go away? So in the... In the uh, abstractions that are in the function that calls by, that's called by the kernel to queue the request, the, the uh, block layer guarantees that this request has a ref count of at oh. least one. Okay, so you require those existence guarantees to be provided by the caller, yeah. by the kernel. Yeah, okay. exactly. Thanks. But then again, if, you, if you're not familiar enough with the block layer code and reuse a request that's also used by someone else, then the table I showed before uh, where, when the uh, ref count is, uh, is two, there's actually exactly one reference, Rust reference to the request, that doesn't hold, right? So, that was uh, too little domain-specific knowledge on my part to use this correctly. So what, what else? Well, let's just, we have this private data area in the request, let's just take some of that uh, and say that's now also uh, that's not private anymore, that's uh, owned by the Rust block layer, and then we put the private data below that. Um, and then we put the ref count there, a ref count there. Uh, I mean, we could have put it in the struct request, but I didn't, I didn't want to bother Jens too much, so I put it down here, right? And um, of course, this adds uh, complexity, because now we have a, another ref count that we need to manage to make our stuff work but the user never has to do anything. It just works for the driver implementer, but there will be more code in these abstractions that you will need to, uh, we need to maintain, we need to read and understand if you want to make changes. And so now we can fix uh, the request, uh, the end request function. Um, somewhere in the Rust code, there is this function. And now what we do is we take this uh, ref count and so what we want to do is we want, when we call end request, we want exactly one Rust reference to exist to this object. If there's more, it means you uh, cloned the reference and stored it somewhere else, and uh, then you, you're not allowed to end the request. Uh, and so we just do a compare swap, say there should be, uh, this number should be two, we want to swap it to zero. If, that not, if that's not the case, we return an error. Otherwise, uh, we return OK. And to the user, there's really there's no overhead for this, except that the um, request end is now fallible. Like, it could go wrong. If you did something wrong in your code, you will have an error. And the code that's in the, um, there's like the, the upstream null block 
which is really just like a hello world kind of thing, looks like this. Basically what we do is we bug if the, the, uh, um, if the condition is not true. If we fail to complete the, uh, the request, we crash the kernel, because it should never happen. I know pe some people are not fond of this, but yeah, that's what we do. The other one, the tag to, um, uh, okay, it should be RQ here, so typo, tag to RQ. Let's see. We try, again, we try to uh, convert the, we try to get the tag converted, and now it, the, this uh, must be at least one, the ref count, because if it's zero, we are trying to get, a, we are trying to get an ID into a request, that is that we don't own that's owned by the kernel and then again we, the complexity for the user is we now have to this is now fallible and it can fail and in this case we just we don't crash the kernel we just put a warning yeah. and of course this uh, has a cost it has a cost to add an extra um, ref count to every io operation uh, but it turns out, I mean, in some cases it's, it, it's a high cost, in other cases it, it doesn't matter. Uh, and on average, it's around a 2% performance, uh, a 2% degrade, uh, let's say, a 2% reduction in the IOPS uh, operations per second we can do. This graph shows uh, the effect of removing the check. Right? So positive here means that having the check is slower. And you can see for some, uh, con so I don't, I don't know if the figure is readable, but what we have on top is random read. It's a FIO, FIO workload doing a random read or random write in different uh, configurations of block size and queue depth. And so if we, when we do the random read in, um, in the, uh, and we have low, small block size, we, we do this operation a lot. We have uh, up to 20% overhead for just doing this uh, doing this check. For, for some reason, for write, it's not a, it does not have any effect. So now the question is, should we have this check, right? Or because that's a lot, that's a huge price to pay. Um, and what I'm thinking now is maybe we should have like, a, like when you're running, maybe you're not running with lockdep in production. So you can run your, you can, maybe you can run in test and you can like have this check you can fuzz your driver and make sure that never happens. And then maybe in production, you can just uh, disable it. And then sure, you don't get, your, your driver is no longer mathematically proven to be safe, but maybe that's okay. If like when, it, when you had the check, you never saw any problem, you can just like remove the check at, uh, at runtime. That's my idea anyway. So, this is all I have, so uh, to reiterate, we can't get around that the abstractions that we put in place add complexity, and they are absolutely 75 lines of uh, weird brackets. Um, but the user implementing the drivers will never see this. Yeah, there's a question over here. So that check you're describing, uh, it's a check about ref counting? Yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, basically it's a, it's a lifetime check. We, um, it's a dynamic lifetime check. So uh, I, I would advise you to uh, look at the patch that I sent uh, in the recent days about combining hazard pointers with reference counting, because I think that could generally solve pretty much all of your fast path problems. So a hazard pointer is a pointer that's allowed to suddenly become nothing, and then you, like, I don't know how that works. I will check it out. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, in C, uh, there's the GNU, in GNU C, there's the malloc attribute, which uh, guarantees that after a function, the lifetime of an object is created, and then there's another function which will kill the lifetime of that object. Might that be useful to do a similar thing in C, which also has zero performance uh, cost because that's uh, checked at the static analysis with F analyzer? That's basically what the Rust compiler does to everything. 
But yep. in this particular case, it's I couldn't find I couldn't make the compiler statically determine the lifetime of the request because the driver might do anything. Like the driver is not written yet. We have to allow the user to write any kind of drivers that does all kinds of stuff with the request. And I didn't want to put restrictions on what the driver implementer uh, developer can do with the request. So yeah, so that's why I opted for the uh, the compa the oh, sorry the runtime check instead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is about uh, compil compilation time overhead. Uh, do you have a general like ballpark idea of uh, what kind of overhead uh, at compilation time you might expect when converting these big uh, C subsystems into Rust? Uh, in general, the Rust compiler is slow, like it feels slow, but it also does like a ton of checks. It's even slower than C++. So if you've ever built like a large C++ project, uh, I would imagine that building the kernel with a ton of Rust will go the, in that direction. It will be slower. Um, to, for the stuff I do, it doesn't matter. Like I build the kernel on my laptop, it's so like a tiny laptop and with all the Rust stuff and it, it builds in like three minutes or something. It's okay. not a problem. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm around and uh, feel free to hit me up and I'll explain anything you might have. Um, did you consider wrap the, some of the IDs you presented before into a private struct so people cannot pass random IDs but must use the one provided by the function? Well, we have to... Um, can we wrap that somehow? I didn't consider that because in general, like we have the um, request has an ID. It, it could be like an opaque point or just to something. But we have to put that into the messages we send to the hardware. So we have to, we have to be able to obtain it somehow and put it, the, because the, uh, the, like the uh, encoding of the protocol, hardware specific protocol requires us to actually obtain these bits and put them in the message. And when the hardware completes the request, get them out again and give them to the block layer to like give us the right request. Uh, so I think it would, I don't think it would be viable to hide them behind some kind of abstraction. Okay, thanks. A uh, quick question about uh, the lifetime of the objects you're trying to protect. Uh, so I was looking at the C++ smart pointers or auto pointers. So is that the concept you would like to have to represent kind of longer term ownership and then some kind of notion of having short term, um, or let's say, uh, existence guarantees that without overhead? Would that solve what you're trying to achieve there? Uh, that is, the, I mean, I didn't go into details, but that is what, what I did. We have, uh, in Rust, we have many different kinds of pointers, and we have some that, uh, ref counted pointers that mimic uh, Siat pointer in C++. We have something called box, which is basically a unique pointer. And in the kernel, we have something called uh, AREF, which is basically, we use that to represent C structures that's reference counted internally by a ref count T. Thank and that's what I put here. Um, so yeah, yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one last thing.